minimise the impact on the travelling public as we improve uh, rail services right across the country. Thank you. We move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Kezia Dugdale. To ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Kezia Dugdale. President Officer, Alex Salmon told The Courier on the 8th of January that the SNP would contest the general election, arguing that full fiscal autonomy should replace the Barnett formula. Does Mr Salmon speak for the First Minister on this issue? First Minister. Well, here's another hold the front page moment. I believe Scotland should be in charge of our own resources. You know, Labour are trying to divert attention from something rather embarrassing that happened this week. You know, Labour have got a cheek to come here and throw, as I'm sure Kezia Dugdale is about to do, bogus accusations at the SNP when on Tuesday this week, Scottish Labour MPs yeah. trooped through the lobbies of the House of Commons with the Conservatives yeah. to vote for an additional £30 billion yeah. worth of cuts. Yeah. That's what we face if Labour gets its way. I think it's far better for Scotland to be in charge of our own resources. President Officer, I won't take a lecture from a First Minister that can't even spend the money she's got. And what's more, the Labour Party stands for a 50p tax, a mansion tax, a banker's tax, all things that the Tories don't support, and neither, by the way, President Officer, do the SNP. On the radio this morning, Fergus Ewing said the oil crisis is the most serious job situation Scotland has faced in living memory. Yesterday, the First Minister said jobs were under threat. It begs the question why the First Minister took so long to find Aberdeen on a map. Order. During her visit, the First Minister admitted that falling oil prices posted a threat to jobs in Scotland. Will the First Minister now also admit that falling oil prices poses a risk to revenue as well? First Minister. Well, can I just firstly remind members across the Chamber exactly what Labour does stand for? Here it is here. The Tories' charter for budget responsibility, which Order. the Tories themselves say demand Order. £30 billion of additional cuts. That's what Labour voted for with the Conservatives in the House of Commons this week. Diane Abbott, Labour MP, said that in doing so, Labour had done a great disservice to hard-working people across the country. You know, the only Labour MP in Scotland that had the gumption Order. to vote against Tory cuts was Katie Clark. Kezia Dugdale's opponent for deputy leader. I'm sure there's a few Labour members today wondering if they picked the wrong person. But if we can get on to presiding officer, the serious issue of the jobs concern in the North Sea, it's because there is a really serious concern that yesterday I established a jobs task force to work to maintain employment levels in the North Sea, to give practical assistance to those who are faced with the prospect of redundancy, and to give a guarantee to every apprentice working in the oil and gas sector of continuing employment or training. That's the kind of practical help people want from the Scottish Government, not petty political point scoring like we're getting from Labour. Thousands of jobs at risk in the North Sea, and Nicola Sturgeon's priority is to have a pop at the Labour Party. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Order. The First Minister spent two years telling us how important the Barnet formula is to Scotland. I agree. And the Bank of England Governor's comments from yesterday show how important being part of the UK is for Scotland. But the reality of the First Minister's plan for full fiscal autonomy would be to trade the stability of Barnet for the instability of oil prices. 
Can the First Minister tell us what assessment has she made to the cost of public spending in Scotland from her plan to bin Barnet? First Minister. Westminster parties really have no shame. You know, if their argument is... Order. If their argument is, and it's not... It's not an argument. Mr. I, Baker! Uh, but if their argument is that Scotland's finances are not equipped to cope with a period of low oil prices, the simple fact is that is a direct result of decades of Westminster mismanagement. You know, does Kezia, does Kezia Dugdale, does Kezia Dugdale never ask herself? Why we never hear anyone question Norway's ability to run its own affairs during periods of low oil prices, that is because they've accumulated a £500 billion oil fund. By contrast, Westminster parties have raked in £300 billion from the North Sea and they haven't saved a single penny. So if the problem is Westminster mismanagement, it strikes me as incredible to suggest that the solution is even more Westminster mismanagement. And on the last two or three years, let me tell you what this government's been doing to help the sector in the North Sea. We, in 2011, voted against the 12% hike in the supplementary charge that has crippled exploration and investment in the North Sea. Labour didn't vote against it. Labour have been silent as we have been calling for the tax change that the industry told me yesterday they now desperately need. So why doesn't the Scottish Labour Party get behind the efforts of the Scottish Government and desist from the petty political point scoring? President officer, it's a new First Minister, but it's the same old song. At my first outing at First Minister's question, I offered these benches support to the First Minister if she could tell us specifically what it was she was asking the UK Government to do. Since that point, Jim Murphy has written twice to Nicola Sturgeon, asking her to spell out what it is she wants from the UK Government, and twice she's failed to respond. We checked that again this morning. Nothing, Can I say, nothing, presiding nothing, officer, nothing. that the First Minister, her own figures on how much money we would have to spend on public services has been out by billions in the last two years. The experts tell us that Barnet is worth £16 billion for Scotland. And the First Minister continues to base her economic and social policy on an oil price that is double the reality. Isn't it the case that whilst Nicola Sturgeon thinks it's smart for the SNP's election campaign, her plan to bin Barnet is downright bad for Scotland? First Minister. Order. Well, Kezia Dugdale says she doesn't know what it is that the Scottish Government is specifically asking the UK Government to do to help the North Sea industry. So let me repeat it for her. Fergus Ewing said it in the Chamber in a statement just last week. So let me repeat it for her. We want a general investment allowance that our modelling shows could protect 26,000 jobs every year. Uh, we want that allowance, as the industry does, to be basin-wide. Secondly, we want a reversal of the increase in the supplementary charge. Our modelling shows that that could protect up to 5,600 jobs every year. And thirdly, we want the UK Government to introduce an exploration tax credit. When Norway did that in 2005, the rates of exploration increased fourfold. Those are the practical measures we're calling for. And if Kezia Dugdale hadn't heard them, then I really don't think she's been listening hard enough. And when it comes to the fiscal future of Scotland, let me just repeat this point. Labour this week trooped through the lobbies in the House of Commons with their allies in the Conservative Party to impose Order. 30, 30 billion pounds of additional cuts on Scotland. That's what will have an impact on Scotland's public services. That's what will have an impact on Scotland's economy. And Scottish Labour MPs should be deeply, deeply ashamed of themselves. Question two. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the First Minister when she'll next meet the Secretary of State for Scotland. First Minister. Uh, no immediate plans. Ruth Davidson. Thank you. Presiding Officer, two years ago, this SNP government started producing a series of oil and gas bulletins 
to predict the tax revenues from the North Sea. These bulletins allowed SNP ministers to tell Scotland that, and I quote, there can be little doubt that Scotland is moving into a second oil boom. We all wish that was true, but it's not. And anyone who questioned it was shouted down. This matters because the First Minister has confirmed again today that after the general election, it wants to get rid of the block grant and use oil to pay for Scotland schools and hospitals. You'd think, therefore, that they'd want figures to show how much revenue that would raise over the coming years. So can the First Minister confirm today that the Scottish Government has now decided to stop publishing these bulletins? Uh, First no, Minister. we will uh, publish an oil and gas bulletin in due course in order to predict... Order! It's a serious point to be order. made here. In order to predict tax revenues from the North Sea, you have to first know what the tax rates that apply to the North Sea are going to be. And that brings us right back to yeah. the point that we're making. The UK government hasn't yet told us what the position is going to be on the supplementary charge or on an investment allowance or on exploration tax credit. So if Ruth Davidson wants to join with me and calling today on the Prime Minister, on the Chancellor of the Exchequer, on the Energy Secretary to stop prevaricating and introduce tax changes now that the industry are crying out for, then I will very much welcome her support. Ruth Davidson. I'm very pleased to hear that the uh, SNP government is going to further, uh, produce further oil and gas bulletins. It seems slightly at odds with uh, a PQ lodged by my colleague Gavin Brown on the 18th of December, answered by her oil minister that didn't say the same that I'm happy uh, to make public through SPICE. What I would like to know is that future oil and gas bulletins use exactly the same methodology as the ones previously uh, suggesting a second oil boom for Scotland. And I welcome not just the bulletin, but all concrete steps to help the oil and gas industry, including the task force that the First Minister is setting up. I note, however, that it seems to be reporting to a body whose stated remit is to allow rapid response to oil industry needs, but which has not met in seven months. When it comes to oil, this government has inflated the figures for political ends. Its response has been insufficient, and frankly, I would suggest anything but rapid. So yes, let's all work together on short-term issues. But when there is an industry in crisis, jobs are being lost, when the Governor of the Bank of England says Scotland's spending is being protected from such a crash, it's only damaging to talk of ripping the industry out of its current UK framework. Or doesn't the First Minister agree? First Minister. Well, firstly, on uh, Ruth Davidson's uh, commitment to support all practical measures, I welcome that. It's certainly a welcome change of attitude from a supporter of a government that increased the supplementary charge from 20% to 32%, it's something that has had such a damaging impact on the industry. In terms of uh, the first part of her question, uh, the task force that I established yesterday will meet before the end of this month. It will report into the Scottish Energy Advisory Board, which will meet on the same day that the Scottish Cabinet will be in Aberdeen on the 16th of February under my chairmanship. So this government will do everything we can to help the industry during this period. Period, and we'll continue to look at all practical suggestions for what we can do. But when I met with industry representatives yesterday, they were universal in their demand for action from the UK government, for action now, not sometime in the future, on tax, and for action to accelerate the pace of the implementation of the new oil and gas authority, the new regulator for the industry. So instead of uh, coming here, as she does, because it's First Minister's questions, and uh, said, suggesting that these things lie within my gift, I think Ruth Davidson would be far better advised to join me in calling on the UK government to get its act together, to Absolutely. implement these changes now, because if she does so, she won't just have my support for that, she'll have the support of the industry as well. <laughs> Two supplementary questions, Mark Macdonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware of the announcement of job losses at BP, headquartered at Dyson, my constituency, and that today's Press and Journal has suggested that Premier Oil, based at King's Wells in my constituency, may follow suit. Can I welcome the establishment of the Energy Jobs Task Force and ask the First Minister how the task force will interact with these companies and affected employees 
as many of my constituents are going to be affected by these announcements. First Minister. Well, the task force will implement a coordinated response to the current challenges with all partners in government, our agencies, the trade unions and industry working together across the sector to maintain jobs and to mitigate the potential impact of any losses. Uh, the task force will decide how best to address specific circumstances and will liaise with the companies and individual employees concerned to identify the practical advice and assistance which might be provided. And they will, in the process of doing that, of course, raise awareness of existing initiatives and support that is available from organisations like Scottish Enterprise, Scottish Development International, Skills Development Scotland, local authorities and PACE. And crucially, presiding officer, uh, the task force will have a role in matching skills requirements to market demand, encouraging the industry subsectors to collaborate to ensure core transferable skills are retained here in Scotland. Patricia Ferguson. Thank you, presiding officer. Over the last few days, the people of Malawi have been affected by severe flooding in a number of areas in the south of the country and in Rumfi and Karonga in the north. It is reported that at least 48 people have been killed and 69,000 have lost or been forced from their homes. The president has declared a state of natural disaster and has appealed for international help to provide shelter, food and basic sanitation in the affected areas. It is rightly said that it is the poorest and most vulnerable who are most affected by climate change. And in Malawi this week, we have the unfortunate proof of that fact. Can I ask the First Minister, therefore, what additional help her government can provide at this time and put on record this Parliament's solidarity with our colleagues and friends in Malawi struggling to deal with the consequences of this disaster? First Minister. Um, can I... I commend Patricia Ferguson for raising this important issue in Parliament today. I'm sure I speak on behalf of everybody in the Chamber when I say our thoughts are very much with the people of Malawi and I have no hesitation in expressing, as Patricia Ferguson has asked me to do, the solidarity not just of this Parliament but I'm sure of the entire Scottish nation uh, with Malawi at this time. Uh, Patricia Ferguson will be very well aware of the very good work the Scottish uh, Government does in Malawi and we stand ready to help with the current uh, situation in any way we practically can. It may be helpful uh, to Patricia Ferguson to meet with uh, Fiona Hislop and Hamza Yousaf, the ministers responsible here, uh, both to hear what the Scottish Government is and might be able to do, but also to hear suggestions from Patricia Ferguson and others that might uh, help develop our own thinking in the matter. Question three, Willard Rennie. To ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, minister uh, matters of importance to the people of Scotland. Willie Rennie. If you are an oil worker in Aberdeen today about to lose their job, I think you would be appalled by the, what we have witnessed over the last 20 minutes. The response from the First Minister was completely inadequate. We are all interested in the future of this sector and to claim otherwise I think lets her down. Working, working in partnership is essential. I was pleased to see the establishment of the Scottish Government's task force yesterday but was surprised that UK bodies such as Job Centre Plus, Department of Energy, Department of Business were excluded. Can I invite her to open up the task force to include all those with an interest of the future of this important sector. First Minister. Um, can I say to Willie Rennie, uh, I, I agree with him in many respects in terms of uh, the, the tenor of his question. Um, I believe the most important thing we have to deal with right, right now is the jobs situation, which is why yesterday I announced the jobs task force and the apprenticeship guarantee. Uh, the first question I was asked uh, in this session of First Minister's question wasn't about jobs. It was an attempt to score political points. I'm glad Willie Rennie has brought us back to the question of jobs. On the issue of the membership of the, the task force, uh, nobody is being excluded. I want to make sure that we work with all interested parties and everybody who has a contribution to make. Uh, we are, as uh, Willie Rennie has just heard, making very specific calls on the UK government uh, for the action we believe they should take. But I'm also very open through the work we are doing to the contribution of the UK government. And I'd be happy to take forward Willie Rennie's question in that spirit. Willie Rennie. If she is changing the government's policy to include Job Centre Plus, to include the Department of Business and to include the Department of Energy, then I would welcome that. But that is not what she said on the television last night. She deliberately excluded 
these organisations from a role in this task force. She started off her premiership by claiming she wanted consensus, but all she seems to be interested now is exclusion. So when so many people's jobs are at stake, will she change her mind? Will she clarify? Is Job Centre Plus going to be included? Is the Department of Energy going to be included? Is the Department of Business going to be included? That's what this chamber wants to hear. First Minister. I, I don't know what Willie Rennie thinks he saw on the television last night. I said nothing at any point yesterday that excluded anybody from the work of the task force. So in direct answer to Willie Rennie's question, yes, I would welcome the contribution of all of the agencies he has spoken about, and we will seek to procure uh, the engagement of those agencies. Willie Rennie might also be interested to know that one of the recent jobs task force that this government established uh, over the uh, closure and job losses at Vion, uh, the Scottish Government worked in that example seamlessly with both the DWP and with Job Centre Plus. So our record says that when it comes to protecting jobs, when it comes to standing up for crucial sectors of our economy, then this government will work with anyone. And therefore, I'll be happy to have the contribution from all of these agencies and departments that Willie Rennie has spoken about. So instead of still trying to suggest there's some disagreement between us here, I suspect he should be welcoming the outbreak of consensus on that point. Question four, Jimmy D. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government is taking to support NHS frontline services. First Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government has protected and increased NHS Scotland's frontline budget, and that has enabled boards to increase NHS staffing to a record level. This has been achieved against a backdrop of the current Westminster Government slashing of our fiscal resource budget by 10%. Uh, this week, we announced a further uplift for NHS territorial boards of £65 million in the next financial year, which will ensure that all boards' funding increases by at least 1% above the rate of inflation. Jamidi. I thank the First Minister for that answer, but given that 60% of the cuts to the Scottish revenue budget imposed by Westminster are still to come, does she agree that in order to give the NHS both its dedicated staff and the people who use it day in and day out the certainty which they need for the future, all parties in this chamber should commit to increase the NHS revenue budget in real terms for the remainder of this Parliament and for each and every year of the next Parliament? First Minister. Uh, yes, I agree very strongly with that. It's exactly why we have committed to increasing the NHS budget in real terms, not uh, only for the remainder of this Parliament, but for each and every year of the next Parliament too. To give that commitment to the resource budget of the NHS is extremely important for planning purposes. And I think it's incumbent on every party in this chamber to give an unequivocal commitment uh, to match these plans so that our NHS does have that degree of certainty for the years ahead. Jenny Mara. Does the First Minister anticipate further pressure on NHS services over the next few weeks? First Minister. Uh, the NHS always works under pressure. I think the NHS has worked under pressure since the day and hour it was established in 1948. But under pressure, it does a fantastic job. Those working in the front line do a fantastic job. The Health Secretary and myself are in very uh, close uh, engagement and oversight of the current winter pressures that the NHS is coping with. Uh, we will continue to be so, and the Health Secretary in the Chamber yesterday spoke of our uh, determination to make sure we learn for the future to look at what we can do better with NHS boards to prepare even better for winter in the future. But I think, uh, given that we are still in the grip of winter, Presiding Officer, uh, I think it's important for all of us across the Chamber to record our thanks to all of our staff across the NHS for the fantastic work they're doing. Question five, Jackie Bailey. To ask the First Minister for what reason the Scottish Government's budget underspends have increased over the last few years when its budgets have been reduced. First Minister. Well, I'm glad to hear uh, at last Jackie Bailey at least uh, acknowledge the fact that Scottish Government's budgets have been reduced. In fact, over the course of the current spending review, we face a real terms cut in our fiscal Dell budget of about 10% with our capital budget being cut by over a quarter in real terms. And as we've just heard, Labour have signed up to continue with those cuts by voting for the Tory budget plans this week. On the budget underspend, the claims I've heard from the Labour Party, I think, go some way to explaining why Labour is no longer in charge of our public finances. In terms of the money the Scottish Government actually has discretion 
over. Uh, the underspend amounts to 145 million, which is 0.5% of our budget. And as John Swinney told Parliament in June, every penny of that will be spent this year. Uh, by contrast, uh, the last Labour government, by the time they left office in 2007, had accumulated underspend of £1.5 billion. Pounds. Jackie Bailey. That Order, Ms Bailey. Presiding officer, it is the case, it is the case that the budget underspend has risen to £444 million. Pounds. That's double, double Order. the amount in the previous financial year. And this at a time when teacher numbers are cut, college places have been slashed and police stations have been closed across the length of the country. So can the First Minister tell me that when John Swinney said Long gone are the days when hundreds of millions of pounds of government money would be underspent each year, doing nothing to help communities across the country. Was he just indulging in wishful thinking? First Minister. I think Jackie Bailey has just demonstrated why the entire country should be crossing its fingers and hoping she's never in charge of the Scottish Government's budget. Because it's obvious from her question that there's one important fact. Jackie Bailey, as Labour's shadow finance spokesperson, doesn't understand. 444 million is the figure she cites. Doesn't Jackie Bailey know that 80% of that figure reflects variances in annual managed expenditure programmes and other non-cash accounting budgets? These are underspends of money that the Scottish Government has no discretion over. We can't decide that it's spent in any other way. That's a pretty basic fact about Scottish Government budgeting, that if Jackie Bailey wants to go any further than the current role she's in, I suggest she does some studying and gets herself familiar with. The underspend of the money we control is, as I said, 145 million, half a percent of our budget. Most people, I think, would describe that as prudent budgeting. And every single penny is currently being spent now protecting our public services. So I'll take the prudent stewardship of our budget of John Swinney any day over the budgetary ignorance of Jackie Bailey. Gavin Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Is it true that last year the Scottish Government had an underspend of millions of pounds on the Youth Employment Scotland programme at a time when youth unemployment was over 15%? First Minister. Well, any underspend in money that Order. the Scottish Government is responsible for carries forward into this year to be fully spent on the programmes of the type that Gavin Brown is talking about. Not a single penny of that money lost to what the Scottish Government is seeking to support. And given the record of this Scottish Government in improving the position around youth employment and unemployment, still much work to do, then I think Gavin Brown should welcome the initiatives we're taking. And also, into the bargain, welcome the prudent financial stewardship of John Swinney that has allowed us to do so much to help so many people across the country. Question six, Liz Smith. Uh, to ask the First Minister what discussions the Scottish Government has had with the UK Government in light of the recent terrorist attacks in France. First Minister. Uh, Scottish Government officials have been in regular contact with UK Government counterparts and with Police Scotland regarding the recent terrorist attacks in France and what the implications might be for Scotland. Uh, I've also been in contact with the French Consul General and I've written to President Hollande expressing the support and solidarity that Scotland has with the French people. Well, Smith. Uh, could I thank the First Minister for uh, some reassurance? Uh, clearly one of the most uh, sensitive aspects of the uh, current situation is the debate about a possible ban on extremist speakers at universities and other educational institutions. I wonder if the First Minister could confirm whether the Scottish Government is also engaged in these discussions with Universities UK and that prior to the new anti-terrorist legislation expected at the end of February, advice is being sought for Scottish educational institutions. First Minister. Well, can I thank uh, Liz Smith for raising these concerns and uh, thank her for the way in which she's done it. As the Counter-Terrorism and Security Bill is currently drafted, it requires specified authorities such as further and higher education institutions to have, and I quote, due regard to the need to prevent people from becoming drawn into terrorism. 
There will be statutory guidance to these authorities in how they might exercise this duty. It is vitally important, and this was a point I raised at the last meeting of the Joint Ministerial Committee, that this legislation is appropriate and proportionate to Scottish circumstances. Uh, therefore, we're working closely with the UK Government to draft this guidance specifically for authorities in Scotland, and officials are linking closely with our stakeholders, including universities, in ensuring that the draft guidance is fit for purpose. So I hope that uh, gives Liz Smith the reassurance she was looking for, and obviously this is a matter in which the Government will keep Parliament updated as appropriate. Lucy Graham. Well, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, in terms of anticipating preventing uh, terrorism, in terms of the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act 2000, application can be made for warrant by intelligence services to intercept communications. What cooperation is there between the UK and the Scottish Government in this regard, which together with other legislation does the First Minister consider is sufficient without even further legislation on these matters? First Minister. Well, as... Um the member is uh, no doubt aware all applications to intercept communications on national security grounds are a matter for the relevant Secretary of State within the UK Government, so there would be no uh, routine cooperation on uh, these particular decisions. Uh, I'm sure the Justice Secretary would be happy to meet with Christine Graham uh, to discuss uh, how uh, these decisions are taken and the various uh, uh, issues that are divided between devolved responsibility and reserved responsibility. And if that's of interest to Christine Graham, I'm sure Michael Matheson would be happy to accommodate it. Thank you. That ends First Minister's questions. We are now moving to members' business. So members who are leaving the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.